know that that was amazing. That was really good. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Don't need that silly yeah. mic. So I want to thank Daniel um, and Jordan Ruska for organizing tonight's event and for your amazing work here in Chicago. And all of you in this room are following in the footsteps of a long line of good government pioneers from Chicago. The Google movement started here in response to the lack of fire codes and tragic consequences from the 1874 fire. Now I'm going to return to the subject of the availability of fire codes and the implications for a Google 2.0, if you will, in a minute. But first, I want to say what a real rare pleasure it is to be sharing the podium tonight with the Honorable Susanna Mendoza, your city clerk. For over 20 years, I've spent most of my time putting government data on the internet, and I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times government officials have stood next to me in public. <laughs> There's been a couple of exceptions. I got a real nice letter from the chairman of the SEC when they took over the Edgar service after a two-year struggle. The Judicial Conference of the United States sent me a very nice thank you note for pointing out thousands of privacy violations in district court documents. <laughs> and while that thank you was very gratifying, it was also true that the court administrators called out the Chicago office of the FBI to stake us out and try to make our whistleblowing into a criminal conspiracy. So that sort of canceled out that nice <laughs> <laughs> What Clerk Mendoza and Julia have described is a process of codification that goes on in every city, county, and state in the United States. Codification and the periodic updates to the codes is part of a pipeline. The end result of that pipeline has usually been a big, thick document you could buy for a few hundred dollars, your municipal code. More recently, the codification companies have started selling CD-ROMs, and most of them now have a website where citizens can view their codes. Unfortunately, that pipeline has in the past stopped with these websites, most of which are frankly pretty bad. Most of them are a frames-based interface, cross-links and navigation and search are sorely lacking. There are no permanent URLs, there's no bulk access facility. Those code websites are not valid or accessible. They haven't been touched as surely they should be by the better angle brackets of our internet. I, I had to get a Lincoln reference in, uh, being in Chicago. Uh, earlier this year, I placed an order with American Legal for the Chicago Code and a half dozen others. Now, whenever I buy a code, I always go hard because vendors have been pretty prickly at times, a subject I'll touch on shortly. When I got my half dozen CDs from the vendor, there was a handwritten note asking me to call their director. And I called the director, Todd Myers, and he knew immediately who I was. He goes, oh, you're the one that ordered a bunch of codes, aren't you? Are you planning on building a website? I confess that this was indeed my aim. And to my great shock, he asked if there was anything he could do to help, like signing me up for update services or making older versions of the codes available. Then when I sent a note over to the city officials in Chicago, I got the same reaction from Clark Mendoza's office. This is great. What can we do to help? So I'm pleased to report now that we have quarterly revisions of your code from 2007 on, available in bulk, plus codes for Evanston and Cook County and a dozen other locations in the area. With the bulk data on the net, we were able to unblock that virtuous pipeline of code and the data started to flow. Now you're going to hear about the minor miracles that occurred with the code when Seamus Kraft and his team started using the tools from Lalo Jakeith and other Google 2.0 volunteers from across the country. It really is quite special what's happened. I was shocked this was so easy. Now, you may be shocked that I was shocked that this was so easy. After all, this data is your municipal code, right? It's a law. Believe it or not, the default when it comes to codes is not that these are the laws that people have to know. The default is that the codes are a profit opportunity used to extract rent. It is not unusual to see a price of $500 or more if you wish to own your own personal copy of the code. And grave warnings tell you under no circumstances may you share that copy. Did you know that over 50% of the cities in the great state of California have a copyright notice on their municipal code? Many states exert firm copyright control over their state regulations. And this is despite long-standing Supreme Court precedent that says the law has no copyright because it belongs to the people, not the bureaucrats. Now, you may think this is hyperbole, 
So I want to give you some very specific examples of how screwed up the situation is in places that aren't lucky enough to have dedicated public servants like Clerk Mendoza. Take for example the great state of Idaho. Earlier this year, I spent a few thousand dollars, I bought the official Idaho code, the law of the great potato state. I scanned the 85 volumes, uploaded them to the Internet Archive, and sent a copy to the Speaker of the House with a letter telling him how happy I was to be able to help. Now, Speaker Bedke never answered my letter, but he did hire an outside law firm to put a stop to this wanton promulgation of the law. <laughs> the potato people, and by potato people, let me be very clear. I mean a few hired guns, not the good people of Idaho, or their elected representatives who believe in the rule of law. Those lawyers said the annotations to the code, things like the legislative history and the case notes, were their private property and under no circumstances was I to publish them. Even more shocking, the fancy lawyer from Boise that the potato people hired said that even the words of the statutes passed by the legislature, the naked, unadorned law, could not be published unless I first obtained a license. Potato people are not alone. Same thing happened with the great state of Georgia when I published 138 volumes of the official code of Georgia annotated. The peanut people, those misguided few who wish to deny the good people of Georgia their right to read the law, those peanut people didn't even hire an outside law firm. The Honorable Josh McCoon, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, personally wrote to me and demanded in an all uppercase missive that I immediately cease and desist all copyright infringement and that my failure to comply would be evidence of willful infringement and that he would seek monetary damages and equitable relief. Ouch. I determined to stand up to the power of the potato people and I sent Idaho back a polite letter that explicitly and clearly refused to comply with the demand. Likewise, I chose not to be cowed by the power of the peanut people and I declined to comply with Senator McCoon's repeated demands. Demanding a license to read the law is un-American. It's undemocratic and it's unbecoming. Since the days of the Magna Carta, we have sworn to none will we sell, deny, or delay right or justice. Charging for the law is a poll tax on access to justice, and it's wrong. <laughs> The potato people and their brethren in the eight states that assert copyright over state laws are not alone. There is an even more insidious force in America, and that's the cartel of the code people. <laughs> Chicago is quite special in many ways, and one is that your building code is and has been available for everybody to read. And that's very unusual. All across the country, most jurisdictions incorporate by reference model codes that have stringent copyright restrictions. These public safety codes are the most important laws in our modern technical society. They touch our lives every day. All cities and states require a number of safety codes. A movement that is a direct outgrowth of that tragic fire in 1874 here in Chicago and of the equally horrific Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York. Today, we have fire, electrical, building, plumbing, mechanical, fuel and gas, boiler, elevator, and many other technical codes that are mandated by law. Our cities could not work without those public safety codes. When those codes are ignored, we see the catastrophic consequences. We saw that with the devastating fire at the Tazreen Fashion Factory in Bangladesh. We saw that when the refinery in Texas City exploded, shattering windows a mile away. We saw that when BP dumped 205 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. We saw that in San Bruno when a natural gas line burst and created a wall of fire 1,000 feet high. In 2008, I started publishing state-mandated public safety codes despite the stringent copyright restrictions. I base my actions on the work of the heroic, the heroic work of Peter Veck, the Texas citizen who in 2002 started to post his local building codes and was promptly sued by the code people. Texas 
like other states, had incorporated a model code as a law, and the Fifth Circuit of the U.S. Court of Appeals said what Peter did was perfectly legal. The model code perhaps had copyright, but the building code of Texas was the law, and the VET Court affirmed that the law, be it a Supreme Court opinion, a state statute, municipal regulations, or a building code, has no copyright because the law belongs to the people. In 2012, I started to expand our work to begin publishing public safety codes that are incorporated into federal law. These include technical specifications for pipeline safety, the transport of hazardous materials, codes required by OSHA to guarantee the safety of the workplace, environmental testing protocols for water and air, codes that guarantee the safety of toys and baby strollers and electrical appliances. Before we started publishing federally mandated codes in 2012, it's fair to say that a large part of the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations was simply unavailable unless you spent huge amounts of money. City officials wanting to enforce public safety have to buy these codes, and this is a huge line item in their budget. Federal bureaucrats have to buy these codes and spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Students, journalists, consumer groups don't have the codes because the costs are so high. Almost no libraries in the United States have a decent collection of these codes because the prices are beyond their means. My objection to the codes is not that they cost money, as obscene as those costs are. It is that once we have purchased them, the code people maintain we cannot speak the law. If I want to build a website that compares the building codes in two adjoining states, that is illegal, according to the code people. If I want to put codes from different organizations in a common format, the code make people maintain that is illegal. They say publishing the law is a violation of the law. They say you must have a license to speak the law. Since I began this work at the federal level, we've expanded our efforts to publish over 28,000 codes from around the world, including 18,000 standards published by the government of India and several hundred crucial standards mandated by the European Union. In August, the code people brought their hammer down. Three of the organizations filed suit in federal court and accused me of a massive copyright conspiracy. They have three very fancy law firms representing them. A dozen lawyers are working on this prosecution. The lead on this suit is the National Fire Protection Association, the publisher of the National Electrical Code, a document required by law in all 50 states and by the federal government. If you violate the National Electrical Code, prepare to go to jail. If you violate the National Electrical Code, you are endangering human life and putting property at risk. The NFPA is led by Big Jim Shan. The NFPA is a nonprofit organization, but Big Jim pays himself a million dollars per year. He maintains he has to control who can read the National Electrical Code and under what circumstances, because he says they need the money. He says if they don't get the money, if they don't require a license to read and speak the law, they won't be able to continue publishing the National Electrical Code and people will get hurt. Now let me be clear, Big Jim does good work and he sees a great code, it's a wonderful standard. But when they develop the electrical code and all the wonderful fire safety codes they produce, their aim is that these documents become the law of the land. That's their explicit goal. It isn't an afterthought. And when the codes become the law of the land, Big Jim and the NFPA get a wonderful gift. They get the gold seal of approval of the American people. The NFPA can use that gold seal of approval to sell handbooks and certification, training, annotated codes, membership, and many other lucrative products. Having the law become available all to use is not a problem. It's a huge marketing advantage. Big Jim wants the exclusive right to control an important law, and that's simply un-American. He says he needs the money to pay for his salary and meetings and other good work they do, but he can't do that on the backs of the American people. The law is public property. He can't build fences around a public park just because he wants his cattle to begin fatter. Jim and the NFPA are part of a gang of cold people. There are a couple hundred such organizations 
all scrambling for the official seal of approval of the government so they get a license to print money. Now, the leader of the code people is Joe Baccio, the CEO of the nonprofit American National Standards Institute. Joe also treats himself very well, taking down a million dollars per year, lists himself as only working 35 hours per week, so he has time for his outside interest. Now, ANSI, I sound a little bitter here. Um, <laughs> ANSI has made me their number one policy issue this year, and they've launched a full frontal assault. Million Dollar Joe understands that he's not going to get away any longer with hiding all the technical laws behind a paywall. He's even on record in saying, and I quote, a standard that has been incorporated by reference does have the force of law and it should be available. Indeed. He says it, but he says it like somebody saying, all I want is world peace. <laughs> Just a week ago, Million Dollar Joe unveiled a great fanfare, the official ANSI alternative to our site. And here's what they came up with for their so-called law reading room. They're going to make all standards incorporated in the federal law available, but there are a few conditions because there's no free lunch at ANSI. First, you have to pre-register to read the law. Then, you have to install a PDF DRM plugin on your computer. You have to agree to terms of service that say you will not, under any circumstances, do anything useful with the standard. <laughs> then you may read the law on your computer, but that you may not print, save, search, copy, take a screen dump, or bookmark the document. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> As a condition for reading the law, ANSI will monitor your usage and send regular reports on what you read to organizations such as the International Electrical Te Technical Commission. They will use your personal details to upsell you on products and services. And even if you upgrade from the read-only, lowly, ordinary citizen level to the big bucks, pay-per-view, standards professional level, you still can't share the law and make it more useful. Million Dollar Joe reminds me of Emperor Caligula, <laughs> who passed laws imposing huge taxes on the Roman people. Now when the tribunes, the representatives of the people, forced him to publish those laws, he wrote them in a very small hand and posted them so high up on the walls of the forum nobody could read them or copy them. Caligula did the very least he could for the people. And ANSI has done the same, putting private profit over public service. The code people represent a multi-billion dollar industry. They may have to adjust their business model to face the reality of the internet, but then so has every other industry on the planet. They'll do just fine even if we're all promulgating the law. The code people and their cousins, potato people, <laughs> you know, people, they're not taken to this internet stuff. They're fighting reality tooth and nail. If they want to continue to be lawmakers, they better figure out how to be law givers. The stakes are big. You've probably all heard of statutory damages. If I pirate a copy of a movie or a book and a judge says I'm guilty, I will face statutory damages of $150,000 per work. Now, I want to be very clear. I am absolutely not a pirate. I haven't violated any copyright. There's no way a judge would look at the 28,000 standards we publish and in any way believe the jingoism of the code people when they accuse me of a massive copyright conspiracy. But from the point of view of the code people, they see 28,000 standards at $150,000 per work, and you can see the $4.2 billion statutory threat. I'm facing in my work. When I see the code people wielding these pitchforks, I can only hope that more people will stand up like you have here in Chicago to take control of your code, to say this law is our law. When the code people try and extract rent, I hope you will tell them what LBJ told his civil servants, let the venal and the self-seeking and the tawdry and the tainted fear to enter your building and fear even more to knock on your door. Your work here in Chicago is important because you can make your code available in a much better way. You can show what happens when that virtuous pipeline of code is allowed to flow. You're not very far away from being able to compare the code at two points in time and see a red line as to how they differ. You're not very far away from being able to compare a similar ordinance in neighboring towns. 
Because your code is available in bulk with no restrictions on use, Chicago will get random innovation, that marvelous internet effect. But this is about more than Chicago. As with the good government movement of the last century, Chicago can blaze a trail and teach the nation by your example. By making your code better, you can send a message to Big Jim and Million Dollar Joe. You can send a message to the potato people that the law belongs to the people, that our government belongs to the people, that the people will not be intimidated and count into submission when it comes to the rule of law. It was Jane Addams who said, the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it's secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. We have to own the law, make it better, and make it part of our common life. This law is your law. It's not some petty profit opportunity. We can send a message to the good people that Chicago cares about code, that this country cares about code, that when it comes to the rules of our society, open source is the only way to ensure the rule of law. It's the only way to have equal protection under the law. That's the only way to have due process under the law. That's the only way to ensure access to justice, the right to free speech, and informed citizenry. It's the way we do it here in Chicago. It's the way we do it in America. Copy that code. Thank you. Thank you.